Are we here? Can you hear me? Um, <clears throat> tuck, tuck, sound, sound. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I have a, um, I have a light here that I always forget to turn on. Give me a second. Do, 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 do. <sighs> yes. Is it brighter? Ah. Hello, good morning. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Can you guys hear me? Ooh, I'm so excited today. I have an amazing thing that I want to show you. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to make your quarantine life so much better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, I have to I have to write myself a note here about um, um uh, Okay, yeah, I really want yeah, I just have an idea about something that I want to say <clears throat> So is my audio working can you guys hear me well? Because this thing is telling me, no, okay. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna, let's give people a couple minutes to connect because I think notifications go out in the wild like five minutes, 10 minutes after we start. And it's kind of sad because like we always do, I always do like the big announcements at the very beginning and people miss them out. Um, let's uh, take a couple of minutes. I want to say hi to people. I, I see a lot of familiar faces. Hmm. I see, I see Will, I've seen you around a lot, how you doing? Uh, Salvador, Andres Obregón, um, Professor Chandra was here somewhere before. Um, I, Rami, good morning, how are you doing, sir? No, no, hey, what's up? And I think I've seen, oh, Baba and Monique and Hari Prasad, they're all here. Ooh, so many, so many familiar faces. I kind of like starting to... To know you a little bit better uh, or at least to see you around um, but that is going to change a little bit and I have that's one of the announcements that I have today um, we are starting the discord channel so we already have the server ready I'm gonna share the link today very soon in like five minutes or so and then maybe we now have a place where we can keep the conversation going uh, uh, every week and we can do introductions and we can, I don't know, we can get to know each other a little bit better. I don't know. Um, I've seen, oh, d -back. I've seen you before around here. Welcome again. So, Rav, how are you doing, sir? <laughs> Good morning, sir. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Oh, oh you guys want to check out my coffee mug? Have I shown you this mug? Wait, 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 wait. Look at, look, look here. Mm-mm. Wait, it's still too full. I can't really show you, but um, <laughs> as whenever I'm close to done, I'll show you. It's really cool. Hey, Andre. Hey, Mira. Hey, how are you doing? How was the semester? Are you done? Uh, tell us something. I would like to, if people can tell where they're connecting from, um, I like, I kind of like seeing people around the world. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very nice. Scott. <laughs> Yes, I did give up on caffeine, but I still like drinking coffee, so I do decaf. Um, that's my new thing now. Um, I just cannot. I like the, the flavor, and I like like the morning coffee kind of routine. So I'm doing a lot of decaf these days. I'm doing only decaf basically. Uh, <sighs> all right. Oh, what is it? What time is this? Ten o five. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I see my connection is dropping. Mm. I see the connection is not is a little choppy. Oh, yeah, the connection is not great. Hmm. I don't know what can I do about that. <clears> hmm. <throat> Can you guys see me? Uh, no. 
Oh, I'm having connection issues. Uh, <clears throat> Hey, Lynn. Yes, it's true. This is smiley face. Look, look, look. Mm. <laughs> okay, it looks like whatever was happening <clears throat> is not happening anymore. The video was choppy, right? Yeah, yeah, but it seems like it's better now. Uh, I think we've had internet problems before this morning. I hope we don't get too many of those because I have a really, really cool, I have a really cool thing that I want to show you guys today. Um, so, well, in, in any case, you know that these streams get recorded. So, um, that these streams get recorded. So, and that we will edit the video and post it at some point in the website. So even if it, even if the stream doesn't go as smooth, as smooth as, 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 as it should, um, I mean, if it goes really bad, I can probably just upload the entire video, re-upload it or whatever. Um, uh, but what's important is like the, the edited video, I think. Um, okay. All right. So um, I think we can we can at least start with um, with the with the announcements. Um, so um, okay, quick reminder to everyone. As usual, uh, we've been talking about this. I uh, we made the decision a few weeks ago to transition to a new channel, okay, and and leave my personal YouTube stream. Uh, we call this Parametric Camp. Um, you can see it here somewhere. Can you see it here? Yes. <laughs> so and we will be transitioning in the next few weeks. I actually want to stop uh, the transition soon and I want to just like stream from parametric camp as soon as possible. I'm not really sure what I'm waiting for. What is the, what is the, um, hey Barbara, <laughs> good morning, how are you doing? I'm not really sure what I'm waiting for but at some point we will just stream only from parametric camp. Okay, so uh, please remember if you haven't yet, I have just posted on the chat, I posted a link so that you can subscribe to the new channel. Um, yeah, I think what I'm waiting for is to be able to, yeah, and I, I think I need, need to see like one or two, one or two weeks. And, uh, and also remember that today we're going to be doing a double stream. So I'm going to be streaming now this morning from, and this is from my personal YouTube account, but in the afternoon we will be streaming from, um, from the new channel, from the parametric channel and the link to the new stream in this afternoon, I'm going to paste it here. So in case you want to set up a reminder or whatever, but also remember that all the edited videos will only show up uh, for, uh, for will only be published on the new channel on parametric camp. Okay. Uh, now, as I was saying before, um, let me show you. Let me show you. Yay! we have, we have a discord now. <laughs> yeah. So Kartik, which I don't know if you're here, Kartik, if you are, say hi on the chat. Um, Kartik reached out to me and he volunteered to grab the reins of the, um, of the Discord channel and set up the channels and, and do some like um, management of the um, management of like the roles and the channels, etc. So uh, from starting today, I guess, we're going to have a, a place where we can keep the conversation going. Uh, oh, actually this, look at this and it says that I'm streaming. This is amazing. <laughs> this, how the, everything is connected to everything. This is amazing. Um, so starting today, we have, um, we have a place where we can all have a conversation and we can talk to each other and we can share code. We can post code questions. I really have no agenda for this. Um, I kind of want to use it to get you to get to know you guys a little bit more, but um, I want to run it by the ear and see how things evolve and listen to what you what you would like to make out of this channel. So I'm going to paste right here. I'm going to paste on the chat. I'm going to paste the link to the Discord uh, invitation, which I have somewhere here. Yes, and and you can join it. Um, 
I'm just going to ask, I mean, I don't think I have to ask this, but I'm just going to ask everybody who joins the Discord to be nice to other people. This is a place, I want to build some kind of community, so I want, uh, I want it to be a healthy community with people being nice to each other and helpful, etc. So, um, mm, yeah, so, I mean, just be nice to, be pe to people. <laughs> uh, so I just pasted the Discord link on the, on the chat. Um, when you land on the Discord, you will, you will land immediately on the new channel called Readme, which has some, uh, has like a pin up here that says, oh, please, oh, I see people are joining already. <laughs> so just go to introductions and introduce yourself. And if you want to, videos are going to be posted here. Oh, look at people, <laughs> look at everybody joining here right now. <laughs> so... And then we have a channel called the bonfire because remember this is parametric camp so it's in the evening around the bonfire that where we tell stories and where we chat to each other so the general uh chatter uh channel of sorts uh we called it bonfire this was kartik's idea which i love so um so yeah uh well and i see a lot of people already joining so that's great Remember to please come to the introductions channel. We have a template here at the beginning on how to, if you want to follow that, on how to like introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, how do you heard about Parametric Camp, um, other things that you want to share with people. I don't know. Um, just, I mean, literally for me, this is a way to get to know you guys a little better. Um, so, so yeah, and. Uh, we also have a section here with a bunch of channels that are specifically about code. Uh, so Vanilla Grasshopper, C Sharp Grasshopper, G Grasshopper Sharp, that project that we've been working on, processing, P5JS, even Python. Obviously, that was not me. That was Kartik, right? <laughs> but um, but um, but um, these channels, I think, are going to be meant for people who may have questions and other folks who may want to help them or who people who may just want to share uh, code that they're working on, files, that they're, just share them with the community. We did this, we had been doing this on YouTube. People had been posting links to things that they made out of the live streams. I think, I think perhaps posting it here, it's better or I don't even know, but I, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to be checking this a bit more often, I think. I'm not sure that I will personally be able to to respond if you guys have questions or whatever. I'm not sure that I will personally be able to respond to them because I have um, I have I have a full time job and I have like other projects that I'm running. So I, I have like limited availability, but um, I'm sure that other people will be happy to you. Oh, I see there's already 30 people. <laughs> I'm sure that um, other people with skills and with interest will be able to give you a hand, um, for sure. All right, this is pretty great. I love, I love this. How how cool is living in the 21st century and that we can do a live stream and connect on YouTube while people are jumping into Discord and 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 be connected with social media? I don't know. I'm. <laughs> I guess I'm also saying this from the perspective that I was born at a time where having a com personal computer was totally a huge thing and there were no cell phones. I had, I had to remember my friends' landline numbers. So I've, I've, I've lived through the whole change into the digital connected era. So, era, era. so I find this amazing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell. Am I being old and cranky again? <laughs> Like grandpa stories about when we had no internet and no cell phones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> All right. Okay. More announcements. Um, more announcements. So um, we um, starting next week. We're going to be moving. Um, we're going to be moving. I'm going to be moving the live streams from Fridays to Saturdays. Um, this is because um, I have a I have a project that I'm going to be working full time um, weekdays during office hours for the rest of the summer. So I'm not going to have availability to or to to stream on Fridays. I don't like doing this because Saturdays 
I don't want the stream to overlap with uh, the coding train who streams on Saturdays, Andrew Human who also streams on Saturdays. I hate jumping and overlapping all of those things. Uh, but I, li I literally have no options. I'm sorry about that. So um, hopefully in September when things um, change a little bit and I and etc. Et maybe we can we can go back to Fridays. I actually do like Fridays a lot. Um, so um, so yeah. So starting next week, we will I will be streaming on Saturdays and I will be doing one or two streams depending on how we're doing that week. And um, and um, and yep. Yeah, so you will see if you're subscribed and you turn on the reminders, you will see. You will get those reminders also from your YouTube app or whatever you guys are using to connect. Okay. And, um, and that's, I think that's it for announcements. I think. Let me check the chat. Oh, it's 20 minutes already. Wow. Okay. Um, well, I see you guys are happy about the discord, huh? <laughs> well, um, again, as I said, just feel free to, you're going to be landing on readme. I see a lot of people already. Oh, Victor, Victor Lin sent me a really nice file the other day uh, with diagrams about the live stream that we made that we made um, that we made the other day. Uh, thank you very much for that, Victor. We we have incorporated your diagrams into the files that are published on GitHub, so you will be you will see that very soon. Um, so yeah, so please go ahead here and join the introductions channel and we have a template all the way up here so just feel free to copy paste this template with the icons and the emojis whatever and and adapt it to sharing what you want about who you are and where you're coming from okay all right and i see floor van de Velde is saying that this is perfect for lockdown time <laughs> that is exactly the reason why I'm going to change the topic of today's stream. So I think I, at some point I posted somewhere that today's stream in the morning was going to be, I was going to do like an algorithmic modeling challenge. I was, so I was going to model a Calatrava building. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to start a new series of, I want to make a playlist about, which is going to be introduction to grasshopper, to vanilla grasshopper. Um, I just want to build that. I want to start building playlists that are foundational so that beginners who join the channel can find a resource to like start learning things from scratch and then build up their skills to catch up with perhaps the more advanced streams that we do when we do like a modeling challenge or when we start writing C-sharp code, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to start with introduction to vanilla grasshopper and I'm going to assume nothing and um, that's going to start this afternoon. However, the algorithmic modeling challenge that I was going to do this morning, I'm not going to do it anymore because I want to introduce you guys to a really, really cool app that was released two weeks ago and it's called Memix and, uh, and it basically allows you to, um, it basically allows you to apply really cool filters to webcam feeds so that if you jump on a Zoom call or a Hangout or a Skype call, etc., you can have your webcam, the image distorted or changed with a cool filter so that you can spice up a little bit your, uh, so that you can spice up a little bit your your digital quarantine life. Because like I don't know what you guys do, but like I spend eight hours a day in front of my computer, and four of those hours are Zoom calls. So uh, making them a bit more lively, I think it's I think it's really interesting. Hey Kartik, I see Kartik. He Kartik Misra. He was the one who 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 kickstarted this whole thing. So if you guys can give him a an applause on our behalf. <laughs> he was the one who started the whole Discord channel. We were just talking about this like, like, like right now. Yeah. So, okay. And I was saying this. So this app that I want to show you is really cool on top of that because, and this is the coolest part, you can customize those filters that you can apply by writing a little bit of shader language code. Um, I have not ex talked about this before. Um, I will, it will take me some time until I can, I can allocate resources to write shader language tutorials, which I would love to. It's, it's one of the nerdiest and coolest things ever, 
but um, but I don't have the time to do it right now. So I'm going to do like a super superficial introduction to that. And I'm going to point you to resources to where you can learn more if you're interested in it. Okay. Um, so can I show, can I show, can I show Mimix? Where are you? Can I show? Yes. Exactly. So this is, this is what I would like to show today. Um, where are the images? There should be some images here. Hmm. Okay. Why are they taking so long to load? Oh, yeah. So yes, so this basically, you can have a webcam. Uh, in, you can have a webcam feed and you can apply some filters uh, like old school, black and white, like space Tron kind of thing, uh, rainy effect, vignettes, you can do a lot of really cool stuff. So, um, so I'm going to explain this. So I'm going to do a two part video. I'm going to do uh, like a simple like how do you download this? How do you install it? And how do you make it run on Zoom? or Google Hangouts or Discord or whatever. And then I'm going to do a second part, which is going to be the nerdy one, where I'm going to explain how to customize the filters. And I'm going to write a bunch of shaders that are going to explain, are going to be helpful to explain the basics of how this works. Okay, so shall we get started? All right, um, I see a lot of people joining the Discord right now. I don't have time. <laughs> to do to check it out right now but when i finish today with the streams i will go back and i will like uh say hi and join the conversation etc okay okay so how am i going let's okay so let's start with the video and how am i going to start with this i will probably do the introduction at the at the end like i usually do and then <clears throat> and then i'm going to i'm going to talk about okay so i'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go to Twitter and I'm going to now I'm going to just go to Shader Toy, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will talk about the creators of 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 Memex. You guys can can you guys see this? You see this like a Tokyo kind of like cityscape, whatever. There's no geometry whatsoever here. This was done only, only with mathematical functions. Um, there's no meshes, no textures, nothing. Everything is generated procedurally. This is what's so freaking cool about shaders. But it's also what makes it like somehow a bit difficult to wrap your head around. You need to um, it takes some training. I'm I'm a super super beginner when it comes to shaders myself. So, but how cool is this? All these effects, all the lights, all the all the buildings. There's no one single mesh. It's all just mathematical functions that define this. Um, it's really, really cool. Uh, Memix was done by the authors of Shader Toy. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay, so I will explain more about that in the second video, I think. <clears throat> okay. So how are we going to do this? Um, okay. I will record the introduction later and I'm going to start by saying what are we going to do? Um, how to you in download and install this thing? Um, <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to start. I'm going to start simple with that. Um, okay, 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 okay. All right. <clears throat> Okay, Ooh, let's get this going. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the Memix uh, website, which is at memix.app. And you can see here like a preview of the kind of filters that you can implement by default. And installation is going to be super easy. I'm sorry about this, but as of right now, uh, I'm recording this tutorial on 
um, I think it's May 15th, 2020. So um, as of right now, this is only available for Windows users. Uh, so installing this is just as easy as clicking download. And then you're going to be prompt to download this file uh, somewhere on your on your on your system. And I have um, I have a file here that I downloaded before. So as of right now, uh, we are on version 1.1. So um, I think that if you see this video in the future, hopefully like things will have evolved and like a lot of the features uh, will be much better. But basically, you just double click here, you hit install, you agree to the terms, and you will have installed. I already have it in my system, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, but basically, you will have this installed in your system. Um, and that's pretty much it. You don't really need to have a menu or you really have you don't really need to to have anything else going on. And the next thing that we're going to do is, uh, in order to turn it on, what you need is to just activate any video conference system or basically anything that wants to um, to ping your webcam. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a zoom call um, just with myself. Okay. And you can see that my zoom call right now is here. So my zoom call is I have a zoom call here just with myself. And the zoom call is drawing from a second webcam that I have here on my desk, not the one that I'm using for the stream right there, but another one. So I have two webcams on my system right now. And you can see that I'm in front of Chroma screen because I'm doing this stream right now. Okay, so my zoom call is streaming right now from an, a pro and, and a Logitech Pro webcam that I have sitting here on my desk. Okay, but you can see that on my system, another webcam has shown up here that is called the Memix 32. What's nice about Memix is that it creates a virtual webcam, not a real one, but it creates a virtual one on your system that is going to fetch the stream from a real webcam but it's going to pass that image through the shader filter that you're going to choose. And then that's what is going to output to whichever video conference system you're using. So that's the reason why this system works for Zoom, Google Hangouts, uh, Skype, or basically anything that takes live feed from a webcam. Okay, so what you're going to see now is that I'm going to choose Memix 32. And as I do, somewhere, I am getting this, yeah, this menu, just this UI just popped up. Okay, so whenever you activate the Memix 32 uh, webcam, uh, the UI pops up, and it gives you the option to choose between the filters that you can apply. So for example, right now I have it in normal, so it's making no changes to my video here. But then I can go, for example, to typical Instagram color changing filters, like for example, summer, and then I can apply and then you can see that my webcam feed my zoom is now has like a like a fade out like a die out kind of mm, kind of uh, so I can I can go to winter compliments I can beautify myself so for example I'm going to apply this and yeah I see maybe I'm a little less wrinkly <laughs> maybe I don't know uh, I can focus for example so you see, uh, and now it's blurry on the, you see how blurry it is on this area here, but it's a bit sharper on the center. All right, I can do vignettes. So I can have like the corners be darker. I can do a simple black and white. We will code how to do this manually. That's gonna be super cool. Or I can start doing a bit more fancy things. For example, I can do like 8-bit distortion kind of situation. I can pixelize myself. 8-bit, 8-bit, robot, robot. <laughs> I can go old school. You see? Can you guys see the texturing of like the, the film texturing kind of situation here? And probably this is my favorite. This is one that I've actually been using. It's called Transmission and it gives you like a glitch kind of um, aesthetic with also like a little bit of chromatic distortion on the, on the, on the edges. This is so, so cool. Uh, you can zoom in. <laughs> uh, I think, and then it has like some, some fancy like rain 
or bubbles. Uh, this is more like Snapchat, Instagram kind of situation, right? Uh, has this circle, so you can totally just not. Uh, you can apply like more like Technotron kind of um, kind of background situation. I can switch to. I can use a green screen on top of this, um, if I want, because I have I have my green screen down here. Ooh, see my mug. <laughs> um, and then. I can just, oh, I'm not right, I'm not here right now. I'll be right back at some point, you know? Or I can just defocus myself, completely burn myself out, and, or I can apply a custom filter. Um, right now, the custom filter has this sort of like whirly distortion effect kind of thing, but this is where all the coolness lies because this custom filter can be configured um, with your own shader language with your own shader parameters and that is exactly what we're going to do in the next video that i'm going to explain okay so again quick recap if if you want to spice up a little bit of your quarantine life or your zoom your meetings whatever you can you can install memex it's free um so as of right now so you can install memex and you can create a virtual webcam so that uh, you can fetch, oh, I forgot to say here, you can click and you can choose which feeds you are going to be taken from. So right now I'm taking from the webcam that is sitting right here on top of my desk, but I have um, the webcam that I'm using for the live stream. Uh, I have the webcam that's running on my laptop and I have other virtual webcams that I've been tinkering with lately as well. Um, so so yeah, so if you wanna spice up a little bit your, your video conference life, Make sure to check this out. Uh, it's really cool. <laughs> and if you're nerdy like me and you wanna you wanna go you wanna walk the extra mile, uh, come and join me in the next video, which will show up. A link will show up somewhere here on the screen where I'm going to explain how to customize the custom filter and how to write your own shader language filters and uh, and use them. Okay, I'm also going to explain how to how to be inspired by other people's shaders and apply them to the custom shader, okay? So I don't know where I'm looking at anymore. See you in the second video. See you in the second video. <laughs> See you in the second video. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I don't know. I don't know how was that for a quick video, but uh, okay, maybe I should, I should totally right there I should totally record the introduction <clears throat> and the introduction in the introduction I want to explain this I'm going to go home oh my my computer is going to blow up because I have like seven different um, streaming things going on oof, oof, my computer is, is going to <laughs> okay. Yes, can you? Yeah, the video is super, super choppy. Uh, okay, at least it's recording well. So that, that makes me happy. Okay. All right, so let me introduce, let me introduce the video. Hi. And welcome to this like really short video where I want to introduce you to like a very, very cool app that was just released two weeks ago uh, by my friends at Shader Toy. I don't know if you guys know Shader Toy, but it's one of the coolest projects out there right now. Uh, it's an online repository of open source shaders. Uh, and shaders are a, are a way of writing, using programming to, um, to write uh, applications that can render textures or that can render screens working at the pixel level. I'll get to that in, a, in the second version of this video today. Um, but I think, but I want to show this application because it's uh, what it allows you is to create a virtual webcam on your system that takes the feed from a real webcam. So like uh, your laptop's webcam or an external one, but then it passes that feed through a shader filter that allows you to give it like a, like a texture or to change the colors or to put some geometry on top of it or to do cool things. 
Um, so you, for example, if you see here, you can like change the colors, you can put bubbles, do a rainy effect, do like an old school, uh, black and white old film kind of stuff. Uh, but the coolest, coolest part of this project is that you can actually customize those filters by writing shader language, which um, I will explain in the second part of this video. So if you want to spice up, I don't know when you're seeing this video, uh, right now, I'm, as of this recording, we're still in quarantine due to coronavirus. So if you want to spice up a little bit of your, um, of your video conference life, uh, this is a really cool app to take a look at because that virtual webcam that, uh, that we can create can be used on any uh, video conference systems that you're that you're that you can be that you can basically take a webcam from. So this works for Zoom. This works for Google Hangouts. This works for Skype. This works for anything that can take a webcam. You can take your real webcam feed, or you can take this virtual webcam feed that passes on through the filter. So I'm going to do a two-part video. First of all, I'm just going to explain how to download, install it, and use it. And on the second part. I'm going to explain a little bit super superficially what is shader language and how can we customize uh, the custom filter here on Memix. So join me, it's going to be really, really cool. Okay, so that was video number one. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop this. Oh, no, I should have shown, I should have shown this, right? Yeah, yeah, I should have shown the demo. Yeah, I'm going to redo that video again. Nah. So, okay, so take two. Um, I forgot, this is the thing with uh, live recording, you just forget things, you know? Okay. Hey, Jaime, Pedro, Michal. Hey, Merit, how are you doing? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I should have shown the demo. Yeah. Um, okay. My computer is going to blow up. This is not, this is not being great. Um, I just cannot take, my computer cannot take so much video uh, going on. <laughs> hey, Abhishek, how are you doing, man? Okay, so let me record that part again because, um, because I didn't show a demo. Um, am I going to start with a demo or am I going to start here? I can start here and then go to the demo. Okay, so... Mm, mm, okay. Oh. <clears throat> Hi, uh, and welcome to this really short introductory video where I want to introduce you guys to a project that just came out two weeks ago and that I'm super excited about, especially given the times that we're living. I don't know when are you watching this video, but as of this recording, um, we're still in quarantine life and I spent a lot of time in front of video call meetings. So um, I thought that showing you a way to like spicing those uh, video meetings a little bit up uh, could be a cool thing to do right now. And I want to introduce you to Memix. It's a Windows application that just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's done by the authors of Shader Toy, which is also one of the coolest projects on the internet right now. Um, Shader Toy is an online repository of open source shaders. And shaders are basically a, a programming language that you can use to write how to render pixels on a screen and how to render textures on a screen. Um, what's interesting about this project is that it allows you to take your webcam feed and pass it on through one of these shader filters to give it effects. So change the colors, add some geometry, some form, whatever, and then create a virtual webcam on your system that is using that filter image. So I'm gonna show a quick demo here. So right now uh, I am on a Zoom application here. I'm on a Zoom meeting. 
that is streaming right now. And you can see that right now I have my Memix application, which has created a virtual webcam here called Memix. And this webcam is taking input from a real webcam that I have here on my desktop, but is passing that image through a filter. So for example, here I have summer, I have compliments, I have, um, I have focus, I have black and white, I have pixelation, and I have glitchy transmission. This is kind of my favorite. But the coolest thing is that it can be configured also here on the custom one. It can be configured to write your own shader language, uh, which we will do in part two of this video. So I would like to show you how to, first on part one, we're going to show, I'm going to show you just how to install this and run it on your system. And then in part two, I'm going to explain the super, super basics of shader language. And then I'm going to tinker a little bit with, um, with the custom filter here in Memix so that you can write perhaps your own shaders and, and jump on, <laughs> on video conference meetings with this kind of, um, this kind of funny, I don't know. I just get really bored on Zoom meetings, on Zoom meetings sometimes, so I like to spice it up a little bit. So um, stay tuned with me, and I'm going to show you how to install this and then how to customize it. Okay. Okay, I think that was probably good for. That was probably good for. Um, as an introduction. Um, Okay, the Discord in invitation has expired. Well, we can, well, we can, we can add another, um, we can create another invitation. Where is this? I'm a little new to, um, to Discord. So it should have expired after one day. Mm. So, okay. How about this one? Is that working, Salvador? Okay. So moving on to, do you guys like the, um, do you guys like Memix? I'm super excited about Memix and it's only gonna get better once I show you how to customize it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to look up here. So I want to talk about Memex. I want to show um, bu -bu -bu -bu. I want to show the profile of Inigo. Indigo Keyless. Yeah, you go. Um, and um, I want to. Um, where is Paul? Paul Jeremias, exactly. There you go. Okay, and then. And then shader toy. Uh, but this is going to lag. Uh, open GL. Open GL. Uh, <clears throat> okay. There you go. Shader toy. Do I want to do shader toy right away? Because it's gonna lag my computer a lot. Um, so I probably want to share the toy. Okay, and I do want to. I may want to draw some sketches here and to explain the concept with uh, some diagrams. I probably want to do that. Yes. Okay. So let's get ready for this. Mm hmm. I think I can probably start the, I mean, I can start right away. 
I don't need to do like a post introduction now because this is basically part two of the video. Um, yeah, let's do shader toy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Oh, and I want to I want to I want to look at his YouTube channel. Yeah. Well, like I can I can I can I can point at that later by the end of the um, of the stream better when I point to additional resources yeah um, okay okay so let's just let, I'm just gonna start um, hi again so this is part two of the video that I want to make about introducing Memix. And in this video, I want to talk about how to customize uh, the filters that are uh, available at Memix so that you can write your own um, implementations and your own versions of it. Uh, one of the coolest things about Memix as a project is that it's created by, it was created by Inigo Quiles and by, by Paul Jeremias, I believe is his full name, uh, both of whom are the creators of of Shader Toy. Um, Shader Toy is like a really really cool project. Uh, it's an online repository of shaders, and as I explained before, shaders um, are. I don't really know like how to explain this from in a very technical way, but shaders are basically a way to program how an image should be rendered in a two dimensional screen, or how a texture should be rendered in whatever is going to be displayed. Um, the, the idea behind shaders is that shaders are basically everywhere. So if you use video games, if you play video games, if you do 3D modeling environment, uh, everything that you see on your screen has been passed through shader languages. Uh, and this is very important because, um, because basically all the computer graphics that we, that we have available today uh, in the 21st century uh, use shader language and use shaders as a way to display things on the screen. Um, why is this important? Um, it's important because at some point, um, I don't know if it was like the late 70s or the 80s, uh, a lot of companies, different companies were trying to figure out um, how to make computers display things on the screen. And I do very much like this project because uh, I think it's like a representation of how to do things right. So there were like a lot of different companies that were trying to figure out computer graphics and then they decided to pitch money, like they were all going to be ending, they were all going to end up competing with each other anyway. So they all decided to put money together and create a consortium and then have that consortium create a standard specification on how to do and how to do graphic how to do hardware accelerated graphics for computers. And that's where OpenGL and the Kronos Group was born from. Um, this, is an, this is an open organization that is funded by industrial partners, but it has become the de facto um, a standard for doing computer graphics in, any, in almost any, any device, any, any digital device that I can think of these days. Um, so, if you are playing video games or doing 3D geometry of any kind, there is a very high chance, I mean, a 95% chance that your part of your graphics or part of what you're seeing on the screen has gone through some OpenGL accelerated um, framework, okay? Uh, and what's interesting about this project is that OpenGL also maintains what's called GLSL, graphics shader language, which um, is a very, very simple, very, very low level language that uh, is optimized to display and to render images on the screen. Uh, but what's important about this language is that it's very powerful because it's 
first of all, it's hardware accelerated. So this code doesn't really run on your CPU, which is the main unit that runs most of the code in your computer, but it runs over your graphics card. And that is an advantage because also, and that's the other property of this language, it's not a serial language. So for example, uh, if you have a screen and you have like a million pixels in that screen, it doesn't calculate the color of that pixel one at a time, one after the other. That would be like the serial way of doing it because it's hardware accelerated and your GPU, your graphics card is optimized to perform millions of operation in parallel. Then with this language, you can calculate the value of each one of the color of those pixels in parallel, all at the same time, which is one go. That's why it's so performative. That's why it's so fast. And that's why when you play video games, you can, uh, you can get like 60 frames per second, even though you have like millions of triangles, tons of light sources, tons of textures, etc. Um, what makes this really interesting is that is that um, it's such a low level language that it's mostly based on very simple mathematical function rules. But what's really cool about this is that with very simple mathematical logic, you can get really, really complex results. Um, so by the end of this video, I'll point you to some resources on how to see and how to see examples of that. Uh, but let me, before we get into customizing memics and writing our own shaders, let me first do a really, really basic introduction about the logic behind writing shaders. Okay. And I'm going to use some diagrams for that. Okay. So it's diagram time. Hi. <sighs> oh, I'm out of coffee. Mm. How's everything doing? You guys okay? Is the video good? Audio? Do I still have audio? Is audio working? Yes, I think so. Okay. And then here, um, I'm going to draw like a really shitty grid. Ba -ba -ba. Okay. Fantastic. We have a seven by nine image, pixel image. <laughs> okay. And then, and then here I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to highlight this pixel here. Um, and I'm going to, um, what am I going to say? I'm going to explain that every pixel, you're writing code just for one pixel and that the pixel only knows about itself and very other, very little extra information. Um, so, so yeah, so let's do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do this. Okay, um, something, let me explain down, let me explain first, blah, 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 blah. starting over again. Let's imagine we are trying to render an image uh, and I have drawn the shittiest image that I can think of here. Oh, I should not be using that word. <laughs> Sorry, let me start over again. <laughs> Let's imagine we are writing a program where we're trying to where we're trying to render an image, where we're trying to decide the color for each one of the pixels of a particular image. And I have sketched a really basic image here. Uh, it looks terrible, obviously, but this image is basically um, 
what is it, seven pixels in this direction by, I haven't counted them, but maybe like whatever, nine pixels on the other direction, it doesn't really matter. Um, so the way we do this with shader language is that we have, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that when we write shader language code, what we're doing is we're trying to decide for each one of the pixels individually, we're trying to decide what the color of that pixel is going to be. It's just as simple as that. The only thing that we need to calculate is what is the final color of this pixel want to be. Um, and another thing that we need to keep in mind is that because of the parallel nature of this computation, so like I was saying before, uh, we're not doing a process where we're calculating uh, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, one after the other. No, we are calculating all of them at the same time in parallel. Then another thing that we need to keep in mind is that we somehow have very reduced information about the overall state of the image. The only information that we have is information about the particular pixel that we're at. So very often we will know for every single pixel that we are at, we will know, for example, the coordinates of that pixel. So I'm going to say that this coordinate, if if we start with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, then this, this pixel is going to be probably in coordinates 5 and, I don't know, uh, 4 in Y, for example. So we will know that for every pixel. And we will have some additional information coming in from the external kernel that is calling our shader program. Uh, and we will have reduced information such as, for example, we will have information about how big is the image that we're working on. So we will say, like, the image is 7 by 9. Okay, this is terrible. The image is 7 by 9. We will know that. We will also know things such as, for example, which frame are we at? So how many frames have been rendered already? So you have rendered 241 uh, frames so far, which if we're working at 30 frames per second, which is a very common rate for video, for example, it will mean that we are all, we're about six, uh, eight seconds, uh, uh, eight seconds into our program. Um, and we will sometimes know additional things, such as, for example, in the case of mimics, and in the case of uh, working with a feed that is coming from a, from, from a webcam, we will have access to perhaps a texture. And the texture will have a lot of pixels already. We will have access to a texture that is coming from the main program and that we will be able to look at individual pixels so that we can make decisions out of those pixels. In this case, the texture that we will be using will be um, the actual image that is coming from the webcam. And then we will be able to look at those pixels and do some manipulations with those pixel colors, okay? These things that I have explained here, so this information that is coming from the main program into our shader code, and that we will be used to calculate, that we will use to calculate the color of this particular pixel, these are called uniforms. usually in shader argon, argot, and then um, I will explain how to know which uh, uniforms you have available, and I will explain how to use them, okay? So let's go back, let's go back to, um, to our main, let's go back to, and see how we can write a little bit of this for, for Memex, okay? All right. <clears throat> All right, Jay Kikas, <laughs> why are shaders so fast and cat programs so slow? Um, that's a really good question. I'm going to I'm going to respond to that question by the end of the stream. Okay, so when, once we finish recording this video, if you can remind me of that question, I will I will address it. Okay, so because I'm otherwise I'm going to lose a little bit of focus. Okay, so um, let me. Uh, let me show what are we going to do now. I had some notes that I wrote here. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Okay, so first, oh yeah, we need to go. We need to go to, we need to find where are 
main shader is. Where is my mouse? Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we need to go to find that file. Cool. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to find in our system where the file that contains the shader code for the custom shader uh, is located. And for that, we're just going to open a new browser window. Okay, and I'm going to in my system, I'm going to go to my main hard drive C, I'm going to go to users, I'm going to go to my username, Jose Luis, and you can see that I have a bunch of folders here. I know I have here application data, but I have it enabled because I have on my Explorer window, I have enabled hidden files. So I can click here, app data, local, and then beauty pie, which is the name of the company founded by the shared toy authors, and then Memix here. And you can see that we can find in shader, here, this is the, the main file that I can open with code. Um, and so if I open a Visual Studio instance here, and I drag my shader file, you can see that this is the file that has the code for the main custom shader that lives in Memix. Okay. Uh, if you have trouble finding this, if you have trouble finding this root, something that you can do is you can do the following. You can, you can copy paste here. You can copy paste this way of localizing what is your home drive and what is your home path. All right. And then you can write here, um, you can write here, uh, app data, and then you can write here local, and then you can, you will land in what are your local, what are the files in your local system? And then here you will be able to find beauty pie and then Memix. Okay. So I have a shortcut in my, in my system to this folder because I, oh, I never remember what it is. Uh, so you feel free to make, uh, yourself also a, 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 a shortcut to this. Okay. All right. So we're good. Now I have here shader.txt. This is the main file that has the shader. Um, and this is a little hard to read. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to go to the extensions manager in Visual Studio Code and type GLSL. And you will find that there are many applications, many extensions that allow you to, um, to apply syntax highlighting to this code. So for example, here, I'm going to click here plain text, and I'm going to scroll down to shader lab, which is um, which is an extension that I already installed in the past, and that it gives me very nice highlighting so that I can see what comments are, uh, what functions are, and what um, other things are. Okay. And now, and now that we're here, um, let's try tinkering a little bit with this. And I'm going to explain you like the super, super basics of, of shader language. Okay. All right. Um, I need, I'll be back in, in one minute. Okay. So stay here with me. Don't go anywhere. Um, I'll be right back and then we can start doing some shaders.
Okay, I'm back. Woohoo! Okay, so what are we doing now? Um, okay. So I can probably explain now the uniforms and I can explain a little bit of the basic data types that we have in shader language. Um, I can I also have to explain that this is shader toy flavored shader language that is important to to explain. Um, and then I should probably jump on a zoom call and and make some changes live so that I can. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, so we're going to dock this here. And um, we're going to have this here. And where is the mimics here? Okay. So if I close this, do I still have mimics? No. <laughs> okay, so I think I have to have both open. Okay. Okay, I'm going to apply the custom filter. And how is this looking on the stream? I am on top of everything. <laughs> okay, well, it's not terrible, I guess. And I can zoom in here a little bit. Yes, that's probably good. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we're here, let's go a little bit over the basic basics. Okay, so what you can see is on the right hand side here, I have the main shader file that runs the custom filter that I have here. So this filter is right now doing this twisty thing, but just because this is the code that I have on the right side. Whenever I change that, this custom filter will also be updated. And you can see here that what I have on my left hand side is I, all the all the way at the top. I have a Zoom meeting that is running from the Memix virtual webcam. And here I have the Memix UI that is letting me switch between different filters. Um, and I want to see this because I want, I want to see how the changes that I make on the right hand side affect the streaming of the webcam that I'm doing on the left hand side. Okay, so going back to the idea that I was discussing before, what I was saying before is that when we have, when we have a pixel, the pixel that we're working, remember, shader language is just writing code that is going to be run on every pixel of the image. So and as I was saying before, every pixel has very, very reduced information, the pixel knows only what the main program is giving it as information. And I was saying that those are called uniforms. So if you go here to the main code, you can see that we have some helper comments here that tell us that this shader is getting some uniforms coming in from the main program. One of them is the time that has elapsed in seconds uh, while running this shader, uh, the number of frames that have elapsed over the, the course of running this program, the resolution of the screen, so how many pixels by how many pixels the image that we're computing has. These are values for the two sliders that can customize the, um, the, the, the slider, the, um, the, 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 the shader. And then channel zero has a texture that is the actual feed of the original webcam that is being brought into the filter. Okay, uh, I will explain more about those in a second. What I would like to highlight as well is the kind of types that these things are. So you can see, for example, that time is a float. And it makes sense because if it's in seconds, then we want to have decimal precision. Um, the number of frames is an integer, because um, we cannot have 2.3 frames. And then the resolution, for example, and this is interesting, is a vector with three components. You have 
heard me say a lot how points and vectors are the exact same thing, basically. And vectors are just lists of numbers, one after the other. So what we can see here is that um, the resolution is a vector, but the x and y properties are the width and the height. And then z gives us information about the cropping of the image. Then this, two, this is an array with two values, each one of them being a float. Those are the values of the sliders. And then the texture that is coming from the webcam is this thing called Sampler 2D, which uh, for the time being, let's think about this as a texture. Let's think about this as an image that has pixels in the two directions, okay? Then uh, what you can see here is that I have a bunch of code. And this code is the code that is running the custom roto twist filter that Inigo Kiles created. And if I comment everything out, so I've, I've done, um, because I don't know if this is coming from shader lab, but I've done control forward slash and everything gets canceled out. If I save this file, you can see that nothing happens. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this here so that I create an empty, an empty uh, main image file. Okay, what and I have saved this. What this has done is that it has updated the custom filter and you can see that the custom filter is basically now a black image because I am doing absolutely no calculations with in this shader. So all the pixels are by default, they're just black. Okay, now how, why did I do this? I did this because shaders always have a main function and this call in this case is called main image. And that function usually takes uh, the coordinates of the point that we're in as that's an uniform. And this is you can see it's a vector with two values. So I, here I will be able to know the x location and the y location of the pixel that I am at right now. And what I'm required to return to from this function is a vector with four values, which is going to be the fragment color. So basically the color of this, of this, of this filter. Fragment is a technical word that is used in shader language to define, um, I don't know how to explain, I don't really know how to explain this properly, but basically um, like to define the unit of computation that we are working on. In this case, it's going to be a pixel, okay? Now, why is it back four. Why does this vector has four components? Because it has uh, the RGB components, the three uh, colors, but it also uh, it also requires the alpha um, output, which is the fourth one. Okay. Um, all right. And I would like to remind you that in this case, in Memmix, we're not working with pure GLSL language. We're working with uh, the shader toy flavor of GLSL. That's why we have these particular uniforms. Those are provided by the shader toy framework. And that's why we have some of the functions are specific to the shader toy environment. Uh, the language is like very, very similar. It's like 90% similar, I would say. It's just the uniforms and a few minor functions that change uh, between, um, between the original GS, GLSL, GLSL and, and this implementation. This is a very common thing to do to write an implementation of GLSL customized to your programming language or to your environment. Okay. So let's, um, now that we have, now that we know how to create a black filter, <laughs> how about we start tinkering a little bit with, with different colors. Okay. Let's see some examples of how can we customize our shader. Um, <clears throat> okay. Would you mind zooming in a little bit more? Yes, but I'm kind of losing uh, screen space here. I think, how about this? Kaveh, does this look good? Um, and how is my audio doing? I think it's doing good, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what am, I going, what am I doing next? Okay, so let's talk about, let's, let's make just plain colors. Um, okay. <clears throat> the first thing I would like to do is I would like to write a shader that just outputs 
very basic colors like black, white, red, etc. Um, and we have already done this with 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 here by writing an empty uh, function, but I would like to do this a bit more programmatically. So the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to define a color that has parameters that I that I want to define. So for example, uh, colors because they have three uh, values, they are represented as vec three types, so a vector with three values. And I'm going to call this pixel color, for example, the, pix the color of the pixel that we are at. Okay. And since I'm going to write something where it makes all the pixels, for example, it makes them black. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vector with three values. And each one of them is going to be a float 1.0. Okay, and then I'm going to return, I'm going to say that the frag color the color of this fragment of this pixel is going to be equal to this color that I have defined. I'm going to save this and nothing happens. So I'm going to change this to white so that we can see the effect of uh, the color that we have defined. I'm going to save this now. And it's also not updating. Um, and I'm not sure why. Oh, yeah, sorry, because I forgot that that frag color is a vector with four values. So back four is going to be equal to, uh, I'm going to write this <clears throat> dot y pixel color dot z and 1.0, for example, as for the alpha value, I'm going to save this. And it still doesn't work. <laughs> and now I don't know why it's not working. Uh, okay, so I'm going to pause here. <laughs> And take a look at this. What it, what am I doing wrong here? Because this is still alive, right? Yes. And this is still alive. So, okay, why is this not? Mm -mm. Okay. This is the problem. Is this a problem? That should not be the problem. No. Um, I, uh, okay. This is the other thing with shader language is very hard to debug because you don't have a console because you don't because it's pixely is each pixel is its own thing. So um, okay, so let's say I cancel this. And I say this is going to be 1.0,00,00, so pure red. So this works. So, and does this work? Is this giving me an error? No. So, why was this not working then? Ah, so it is working. Ah, oh, it was working, just it was just black. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, God, as you see, that's what happens when you abandon caffeine. <laughs> Should I get back to caffeine? What do you guys think? I don't want to. But maybe I should <laughs> to stay a little brighter uh, and sharper. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go back to what I was. If I save this and now if I change this, yes, it goes red. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, that was very dumb. Um, I was just, it was actually updating. It was just that I was saying that I wanted a black color. So that's why it, everything was turning black. But if you see here, if I now change, for example, the first channel, the red channel to one, the every pixel gets a red color. If I change the second one to the, the green channel, to one, then everything is going to turn yellow. And then if I change the third one to one, all the pixels are going to turn black, are going to turn to turn white, I can also do cyan, or I can also do pure blue, you know, um, just because I am here, I'm defining a variable called the pixel color, I'm giving and specifying the three values for each one of the channels. And then I'm using that to define a vec four, a vector of four dimensions for the frag color for which is what I ultimately 
need to return, need to define before I leave this function. Uh, and I'm using the x, y, c of this color, and I'm using 1 as the value of alpha. Okay? Now, you may wonder, why are you using here 1s and zeros if um, I've been using 0 to 255 all my life in my web development uh, course or in my, in my Photoshop life, whatever? It is true. Uh, colors are typically represented with, with values between 0 and 255 in other environments, but in shader language, they are normalized. So their value is going from 0 to 1. That's it. It's just a convention that happens here. Okay. Now, what are other cool things that we can do? So, for example, um, I can, because I know where I am in, um, in, in, because I know where I am in, because I know, okay, I'm going, I'm going to rethink what I'm going to say. Um, okay. Uh, what am I going to say? Um, <clears throat> I want to do something where, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do something where I'm going to uh, explain, oh, I'm going to do, I want to explain here a shortcut to this. Um, and I also want to explain that I can take the position of the pixel to make decisions. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> what are other things that we can do? Uh, so this was very simple. We just defined one color, the same color for all the pixels, but we, but for each pixel, we can customize that color if you use some of the external information, some of the uniforms that are coming in. So for example, every pixel is getting a vector called fragment coordinates, which tells the pixel where in the matrix of pixels in the image it is. So for example, here, I can say in fragment coordinates, I can say, for example, integer x position, is going to be equal to frag coordinates dot x, and then another integer y position is going to be equal to frag coordinates dot y. Sorry for frag coordinates dot y. Okay, so now with those two values, I can now make decisions about how to render this pixel. So for example, let's say that I want to write uh, a shader that just draws like horizontal lines, black and white, every single pixel. Something that I can do is I can find if, for example, on the y direction, if this pixel is even or odd, and if it's even, I can make it black, and if it's odd, I can make it black, for example. So something that I can do is I can say if x position modulus 0, 2, equals equals zero. So if that if this pixel is even, sorry, in y position, if this, if this is even, then um, so for example, I can initialize pixel color, and I can say pixel color is by default, is going to be is going to be black. And I can initialize vectors with three values with the same value just writing one here It's a shortcut. Okay. But I can say, well, but if if it turns out that this pixel is in an even position, then let's make that instead, let's make it white. So I'm going to say back three and full white. And then here, I can still keep this here. Um, and, um, and, and this is not working again. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's pause here. Do we have modulos on shader language? I always forget. Uh, ELSL modulo operator. <laughs> Somebody just jumped on the call. Uh, okay, so it's a function. It's not... Um, So 
it's a function. Okay. Ah, uh, and still not working. <coughs> Uh, how to not use module in shader toy? Do not use the module over and all Fox. Two main reasons it makes the code incompatible with WebGL is inconsistent with negative inputs. Uh, so I'm finding here something that tells me that modulo is not compatible. <clears throat> so what do I use then? Um, so what should I use otherwise? Below segments and unify. <clears throat> oh my god. Okay, shader inputs. Okay, want some help. Arithmetic, we have modulo. Uh, how to be careful. Model, please don't do mod x0. This is undefined in some platforms. Okay. I don't know what is going on here. Y position two. Because this is a float. Um, uh huh. Okay. Hmm. Okay, then I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. You see, um, I'm still learning myself too. <laughs> uh, okay, so since I don't know what's going on, I don't know how to fix that either. Um, is this the code that is messing up? Is this what's messing up? Maybe this is what's messing up because this cannot be floats. Um, this is messing up. So. Okay, so this is what's messing up. This is what's messing up. So, um, okay, so what if I do if frag coordinate y is equal? Okay, so this cannot be, this doesn't work. Uh, so this. Okay, so this is what doesn't work. Because if I turn this to one, this is what's not working. So it's this modulo operation that is just not working. Okay, so can I do... Mm -hmm. Can I do... Can I do this? Is this what's not working? So if I change this, this is not working, definitely. And then this is not working. Uh, is Boolean? Nah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is not... Okay, so... So what if, if I... Can I do this? This works. And this, so this is also what works. And 
this, if I change this, it's also working. Oh, I close that. Okay. Shader lab. Okay, I should just move on because this is not. Uh, so what if I do this? Is this working? No, it's not. Oh, because this should be Y position. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I was having a little bit of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, cause I, the problem was that this is a float and I was, this was not automatically being converted into an integer. Okay. That's a very rookie mistake, <laughs> but, but yeah. Okay. Woohoo. Okay. So let's do that in the video. Okay. And let's make everything black. Okay. And then let's continue the video then. Okay. Yes, I found the problem. Um, it's I was doing something not great. So I was taking the X coordinate of the fragment color, which is a float. And I was trying to convert it automatically to an integer and that doesn't work. So I need to cast with a function. I need to cast this value to an integer. I need to forcefully make it an integer before I, I do any computation with that. And if I save that, you can see that now I can use the modulo operator here. Um, and what is happening is that in this image, I'm getting horizontal lines. Uh, the ones that are black are the ones that are on an odd position. So one, two, three, five, etc. And the ones that are white are the ones that have a Y position that is even. So zero, two, four, etc., etc. I could very simply um, change this and now turn it into vertical lines uh, just by looking at the X position, for example. And something that I haven't explained before is that I can, you see how I'm taking to create the fragment color, I'm creating a vector four with four coordinates, but I'm taking X, Y, and C because pixel color is a vector with three coordinates. I can shortcut this just here and then say, I'm going to create a vector of four components with the three components that are here and the fourth value here. And this is still, still works. Okay. Wonderful. So how about another thing? We can also create a gradient that goes from black to white as a shader. Um, we can do this. We can do that. For example, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to clear everything uh, because we know where we are in the vertical direction. We know that fragment coordinates is giving us the pixel value of where we are in the vec in the vertical um, in the vertical position. We can write a very simple rule where we decide, well, if we are all the way at the top, we want the color to be black. So we want zero. And if we are all the way at the bottom, we want the color to be white. So we want one. So we can write a very simple rule where we say, can I find how far along in the height am I is this pixel? And that relation is going to be very simple. It's going to be the value of the pixel location. So one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, divided by the total amount of pixels in the vertical direction, the height of the image. So if the image is 800 pixels tall and I am at pixel 400, then um, my pixel normalized pixel coordinate is going to be 0 0.5. Okay. So that's very easy to calculate here. So for example, I'm going to say, I'm going to say float V, which is going to be the normalized coordinate of this pixel in the vertical direction is going to be where I am in the overall, in the overall uh, pixel. So fragment coordinate Y, so the Y coordinate of this pixel divided by the height of this, of this, um, of this image. And you can see that from the uniforms, I have eye resolution, which is a vector of three coordinates, right? So if I take the Y coordinate, that's going to give me the height. So V is going to be the normalized 
location in, in, in height. And then I can go back to creating my pixel color variable and then just give it the value of V as an input. And as I do that, ta -da, I get a um, I get a, a a gradient that is going from black to white um, horizontally. Okay, if I were to change this to just look at the x, and this would be I would want to change, for example, this to u, for example, then I can have a horizontal um, I can have a horizontal uh, a horizontal. And if you don't like the direction, you can just invert that by saying one minus the value. Okay, and that will flip the direction uh, of the gradient. Okay, so I'm going to keep it vertical. Um, so one minus the resolution in y and v. Okay. Um, and I'm going to have it the other way around here like this. Okay, and I'm going to keep this for something that I want to do later. Okay. Okay, I see a lot of complaints about zoom text. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna because if I do this, I, it's gonna be very difficult to see everything else. But uh, I'm just gonna do it. Yes, this is much better for you guys, right? Okay. <clears throat> Next thing, next thing I'm going to use, I'm going to do is going to be super simple. I'm actually going to take the webcam feed. I'm going to take the image that is coming from the webcam and I'm just, just going to display it as it is with no single changes. Okay. Uh, if you remember, you, we had I channel as an uniform that we could use to, to read information from that image. So uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to compute the relative location of this pixel, so the normalized location in in this frame. Okay, so we know that frac coordinates give us pixel coordinates, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to turn that into something that goes from 0 to 1. Um, shader language is very elegant in that it allows you to work with vectors. So something that I can do is I can say I can divide frac coordinate, which is a two dimensional vector. I can divide it by i resolution dot x and y. So I can divide the two. Um, I can divide the the. I can divide. I can divide the vector with two coordinates by the two coordinates of the i resolution vector, and this will give me a vector two object. Um, I can now, for example, uh, just going back. If I wanted to go back to the gradient, I can just take from this two dimensional vector, I can take the x component, or I can take the y component, and then I can change the direction of the gradient. Okay. Uh, and, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to use that because um, textures, when they come in, uh, in, in, they don't, they don't come in with pixel coordinates, they come in in normalized coordinates. So in order to take the color of, uh, of a pixel in a texture, I need to address that pixel by its normalized coordinates. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the texture function to read from I channel zero. And I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read uh, the UV coordinates of, of, of this, um, um, oh, I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for uh, the pixel in the normalized coordinates u and v that I have already requested for this particular pixel. And you can see that this is currently not working. And I believe that's because texture takes um, uh, I this is a uh, Oh, because yeah, because this gives me a four dimensional vector that I need to turn into a 3d vector. Oh, and I think something is going to crash. Okay. Um, okay, one second. Okay, so what is happening here? Okay, I think I might be 
I might have crushed this. <laughs> okay, so it regenerated the. Um, yeah, I think the error crashed the um, shader, shader toy. So now I can just write here. Uh, Okay, yes. <clears throat> yes, sorry. Um, I think I crashed my 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 memix, so I restarted everything. I restarted the call and restarted the app. And then what I did was Texture returns a vector of four coordinates. So I was having problems fitting it into a variable with three coordinates. So what I did was I just requested from the vector with four coordinates, I requested the three first coordinates, x, y, and z. And that's what I'm using for the pixel color here. And now I'm creating a four-dimensional vector with those three channels plus the alpha, okay? What you can see is that um, we have something weird, which is that my image is flipped. And my image is flipped because I believe um, the coordinates of the image of my webcam are somehow flipped for some reason. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip those manually, just like I did before. So I'm going to comment this out, and I'm going to say vector2, u is going to be the fragment coordinates of x uh, divided by the i resolution x. And then vector 2 v is going to be fragment coordinate y divided by i resolution dot y. And vector 2 uv is going to be equal to a, two, a vector with these two components. Basically, this that I have written here is the same thing that I have written here, just more explicit, okay? Um, but I did that because now if I just, if I want to flip the vertical component, then I can just do one minus this component and then everything gets flipped. Um, uh, except that it doesn't. <laughs> oh my God, I'm doing this and I'm doing a terrible job today here, huh? Uh, why is this not flipping now? Uh, Yes, this is not, what am I? Hi. What am I doing here that I should not be doing? UV. UV. I know, because these are not, these are not, these are floats. Yes. Okay. Yeah, another rookie mistake. This is not a vector two. This is just a float. This is just a one single number. So as I do this, now this works exactly. So this is one value, another value. I create a two dimensional vector with the two values and then I use that to ping the image uh, and to get the, the, the coordinates of the, to get the color of each pixel on the webcam that is coming in uh, and just using that right away as an output, okay? Why is this interesting? It's interesting because now I have here in a variable, I have the color of the pixel that I am in but from the webcam feed that is coming in. And because I have the color, I have the three numbers, I can do manipulations uh, with those numbers. So for example, let's say um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to use, for example, only the, um, the red channel. So here, instead of pixel color, the XYZ, I'm going to just replace this with just using the, the red channel, XXX. So for example, as I do this, what you can see here is that I turn my image black and white, but it's not really black and white. 
it is more of a um, just using just looking at the values of the red channel. Uh, if I do YYY, you would see that I see only the values of the green channel, and you can see that my background is now very bright. Uh, I can you can see Z is only the blue channel, uh, so it makes everything a bit more homogeneous. And I can also take the value. So if I do X, Y, and Z, those that's the original color, but I can take the RGB, which again are the X, Y, Z, and I can swap them and I can combine them. So for example, I can say instead of RGB, I'm going to use the value of the blue channel Z in the red. I'm going to maintain Y what it is, the green, and I'm going to take the value of the red channel and use it in the blue channel. So that's going to be X here. And as I do that, you can see that my color distorts. And then I can do other combinations, X, red, green, red, or I can do blue, uh, blue, red, green, or, and <laughs> I like this one for some reason, <laughs> or I can do red, red, green, or I can do green, green, blue, or I, I don't know, I can do other combinations, you know, um, something that I can do as well is I can convert the image to black and white by, for example, take looking at the XYZ values and calculating the average. So for example, if I say float the value of the brightness, I'm just going to do B, the value of brightness is going to be equal to uh, pixel color, the green, the so the red value multiplied by 0 0.333. Okay, plus 0 0.333. So a third of the value for the green channel y plus 0 0.333 times the value of the red of the blue channel. So Z, and then I can use that to say BBB is going to be equal to um, the three channels of the image are going to be the brightness that I just calculated. This black and white conversion would be a bit more accurate, because, um, because it's taking the average of the three channels as opposed to uh, just one channel or the other. Um, I believe there's actually um, uh, I believe there's actually a better formula. Um, let me find. Um, <clears throat> white bakery algorithm what, what is that a grayscale I think there's one that uh, I forget the name of um, uh, grayscale as RGB Luma uh, this is the one yes Luma encoding yeah <clears throat> so where was I And actually, for those of you who are a bit more nerdy about image processing and color, um, actually using thirds is not exactly how it's done in industry, because I believe uh, there is an understanding that uh, human perception of the eye, the eye has like different perception for different channels. So it, uh, it, it needs more green than red, etc. So uh, it's a very common thing to um, not average when you do black and color conversion, not average them completely equally, but depending on the standard that you're using, use different proportions. So for example, here for Luma video, they use a different, um, a different ratio. They use here, they use, um, they use 299 and here they use 587 and here they use 114. And as I save this, let's see how different this is. As I save this, you see, I get a little bit more contrast, um, which I think it's interesting. Uh, so that can be, um, it's up to you to choose what you want to do. Okay. Um, now, another thing that is really interesting is that 
remember how I was, if I cancel this out and I go back to pixel color here, remember how I'm using a chroma screen? So one of the interesting things is that because I have found the color of uh, each pixel in the webcam, now I can take a look at that color and make decisions based on the values of the RGB channel. So the way you do chroma, for example, is you say, let me look at the pixels in every image. And if the color of that pixel is around, is nearby the color of the chroma, then I'm just going to remove that color and, and switch it with something else. So for example, that's going to be you know, at a basic level, it's going to be quite easy to do. I can say I was I looked it up before. And I know that my um, that this chroma that I'm using right now has more or less this chroma has more or less these values. So it has 99. So this green that you're seeing here is 99 red is 205 green and 164 blue. So what I can do is I can find I can normalize that. So I can with a calculator, I can say, well, 99 divided by 255 is 0 0.38. So that would be 99 in normalized coordinates. So what I can say here is, if pixel color x, the green is greater than we said it was 30.38. If it's the color is greater than 0 0.30. And it's also less than 38, I'm going to say 0 0.45. So I want I want to range because I'm not, I'm not all the colors are the same. And for example, if the green channel we said 205. So 205 divided by 255 is 8 0.80. So if this is greater than 0 0.70. And pixel pixel color is y is less than 0.80. So 0.90 and pixel color Z is greater than where were we? So 164, 164 divided by 255 is 0.65 more or less. So if this is greater than 0.55 and is less than uh, 0.65, 0.75. Okay, if all of this is true, it means that the color that I'm in right now is very close to the chroma color. And if that's the case, what I want to say is instead of piping this color out, I want to replace it with another color. What color can that be? For example, I'm just going to replace it uh, with black. For example, I'm going to say if that was true, then pixel color needs to be replaced with a new vector three. And as I do that, uh, <laughs> okay, you guys see it's not, it's not perfect. It's not great, but you can see the more or less the range of pixels in the chroma are being replaced. So I can replace this with, for example, red. This is going to look terrible. I can replace this with red or I can replace it with um, with the V coordinate of that I calculated before. So the normalized value along the Y, making it then making it um, ma substituting it with a gradient, you know. Um, I'm sorry, it took a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's um, a or the thing is like, this is not perfect. So if you go down to the code that Inigo provided for us here, there is this one function that actually gives us a much better implementation for chroma key detection. So I'm going to copy this and paste this here. Okay, I'm going to um, un uncomment it and I'm going to um, and I'm going to um, I'm not going to explain this the, the math here, uh, because I actually I don't really know that well how it's working right now. But uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to compute here the value, I'm going to remove all of this. Okay. I'm going to compute the value of the chroma. And I'm going to pass here 
the pixel color that I just created. As I do this, um, this pixel color doesn't work. Uh, is this working? Back three color, get chroma key, in and out, pixel color, pixel color, and then pixel color. No, this is not working for some reason. Okay. Um, what am I, what am I missing here now? Chroma key, returns K, and this is an in and out, so we're good there. Okay, so that's good. And if I undo this, this is not working. Get chroma key. Pixel color is a VEC3. Color. Sorry, people, this is the thing with live recordings. Um, they are, oh, it's 12 already. Um, okay, let me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where to use value of K? You don't use it. It should already, uh, it should already do the chroma directly. This is just giving me an error for some reason. Okay, so if I cancel this out and I do this, this works. But if I do this, this doesn't work. And if I, this doesn't work either. No. This, for some reason, is causing trouble. But it's okay. Is this possible that I need to have this here before? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I needed to define the function first. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the video where this was not working. Okay, and now here. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, another rookie mistake. Um, this function, I declared it after, but if I do that, then this function is not in memory. This function is not in memory when this gets called because uh, shader language doesn't do function hoisting. So we, I need to define that beforehand. And if I do that, now this function exists. Well, this function exists when this is called. So I can, I can do like a proper chroma change here. And something that I can do now is I can say, well, k is giving me a value from 0 to 1 um, that tells me basically how much of a chroma I am at. So, so zero means no chroma and one means full chroma because it also, you see like the edges of my shape, they also have like, uh, they do some blending. So what I can say here is I can say, if the value of K is greater than 0 0.1, for example, then apply this, um, this gradient. That I, that I was talking about, okay? So 
you can see that I have some pixels here in my body because this probably have some degree of um, has some degree of green. But maybe this is something that I can use for as a parameter. So maybe I can use these sliders here to tune that in. So for example, if e is greater than i param zero, and then if I change this, you can see that that value, yep, I get more or less, mm, more or less sensitivity in the chroma. Okay. All right, that was a lot, right? <laughs> okay, I think with this, I'm going to wrap it here, but I would like to point you to other references of where can you learn more about shader language and where can you, um, if you want to, if you want to, yeah, if, where can you learn more about this? Okay. So I'm just going to point to Inigo's YouTube. I think. Okay. I may want to record an introduction with this. Okay. Okay. Um, book of shaders. Book of shaders. Okay, this is great. Uh, now, shaders and processing. Shaders and shader language are everywhere. And they're everywhere that uh, in every framework that does any kind of image output on a computer, uh, on a computer screen. Um, and, uh, and fortunately, for the reasons that I explained at the beginning of the video, uh, it's a very standard language. It's very homogeneous. So if you learn the basics of shader language, you will be able to that that uh, that knowledge to like a lot of very different frameworks. So a really good place to start is the book of shaders by Patricio Gonzalez Vivo and Jen Lo. Um, it is a very, very low level uh, introduction and it goes like very, very step by step. So I very strongly suggest that you're that you take that you check this out. Um, if you're in the processing world in the creative coding sphere, Andres Colubri wrote a very good introduction to, um, to shader language as well. This one is a bit more oriented towards three-dimensional geometry. Uh, and uh, because remember that what we saw today is very much for 2D images, but um, shader languages actually are very powerful when it comes to rendering meshes and rendering triangles in, in three-dimensional space. Uh, we have not looked at that technique yet, uh, but I will hopefully at some point in the future record some tutorials about 3D geometry, triangles in space, and shaders, and how to and how to reconcile all of that together. Uh, and definitely, definitely, if you want to learn more, you should check out Inigo Quiles's um, um, Inigo Quiles's YouTube. He is one of the creators of Shader Toy. He's one of the creators of Memex, and um, and he has a lot of really interesting, a lot of really interesting videos on advanced techniques on about how to think of shaders and how to think about mathematical equations and how to use them to generate form. It's really, really cool. And he actually, uh, he actually recorded this, uh, this tutorial here, um, specifically, uh, as a guest lecture for the class that I teach at the GSD. And, um, and he in which he explains how to construct a Greek temple from scratch. Um, and what's so cool is that you see this image here, there is not a single triangle on this image. Everything is generated with mathematical functions um, and with simple numerical rules. 
It's extremely, extremely fascinating. I love shaders. I think it's one of the coolest things ever. Um, so I really strongly, if you're nerdy enough and you have the patience, I really strongly recommend that you follow some tutorials and then you try, yeah, then try it out. Go to Shader Toy and look at what's out there. Uh, it's really, really cool. And uh, you're going to learn a lot about creative coding if you get into shaders. I may do a third iteration of this series where I go to Shader Toy, I take um, one of those shaders and I port it to Memex. Um, that could be an interesting exercise to do. Uh, so perhaps if I do that, you will see like links somewhere here and here. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. That was a lot. Okay. And Uh, and my Zoom call stopped. <clears throat> so I'm going to record an intro to that. I'm going to record an intro to this. Yes. <clears throat> am I here? Yes, I am here. Oh, okay. Hi, and welcome to the second part of this video on mimics. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show you how to write something like this, how to write a tiny bit of shader code to make what you're seeing right on top of here. What you're seeing is a shader that I wrote that is taking the image that is coming in from the webcam and then is doing some chroma cutting. Uh, a chroma that is controlled by one of the parameters here in input parameters in MET. So you can see how now it's like very sensitive and how it's just not at all right now. Um, and then I also generate this gradient background that you see in the back procedurally. Okay. And um, so I'm going to go over the super, super basics of shader language. And I'm going to explain how to implement that in the shader toy flavor that mimics runs. Um, so, so join me in some nerdy shader uh, creative coding today and spice up your zoom life. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this. And I think it's time to break. <coughs> I think it's time for a break. I'm, um, yeah, I need, I need to have lunch. Um, okay. Um, just reminder to everyone, I'm going to be streaming this afternoon on this link that I just posted here. Um, I'm going to be streaming on the, on the, on the, on the link that I posted here. I have to, oh, I have to, I have to save this for, mm -hmm. I have to save this file and post it somewhere on, on the GitHub repo. Uh huh. Yep. That should, I should do that some point soon. Okay. Um, yes. So I'm going to be streaming this afternoon at starting at 2 p.m. Boston time. So that is in one hour and 45 minutes. I think I'm going to start my, I'm going to start the series on introduction to Grasshopper. I may, I may do a quick video porting a shader toy thing. Should I do that? Should I not? I, I'll probably do that. I may just do a quick video where I go to a shader toy and I port it and I bring it into Memex. Um, and yeah, I'm a little tired right now. <laughs> this was very intense. Uh, any comments? Oh, uh, Jay Kickass was ask, asking before why shaders are very fast and cat software programs are so slow. Uh, sh I think there's something about what I said at the beginning that shader language is like a super, super minimal language. It has just very simple mathematical uh, operations, which is something that runs very fast. Uh, in general, um, and and also because 
all of this code is run by a specific piece of hardware in your machine, the graphics processor unit, the GPU, um, which is optimized to do this and to do it in parallel, then it can do millions and millions of these operations very fast per second. Where as opposed to CAD software, where for the geometry, the geometry doesn't, the geometry generation and all those processes, they do not run on the GPU. It's only the visualization that runs on the GPU. So the CAD software needs to, needs to perform all the geometry operations at the CPU. And you only have one CPU. It's very fast and very powerful, much more than any of the fragments that run the shader language, but still it's one GPU. So all the computation has to go through one line. You know? So that's why sometimes the computation is very expensive. It takes uh, a lot of resources and time. Uh, okay. Learn something cool. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I hope it was a little bumpy uh, as, a, as a tutorial. So um, should I record it again? Maybe it's just not ready for production. I'll, I'll decide that when I edit the file. Uh, okay. Um, all right, I'm going to take off. I'm going to have some lunch and I may take a nap. I didn't sleep well last night. Uh, but I'll see you guys, I'll see everybody back at, at 2 p.m., whoever can join, okay? Uh, thank you very much.